I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking a lot this week about um, our friends across the pond. We mark the death of the great Queen Elizabeth and her amazing 70 years on the throne. Our relationship with Great Britain has understandably softened uh, quite a bit since we vanquished them in a war of independence, but the relationship has always been important. And it was King John who, long before the New World Project began, probably had one of the biggest influences on us when he signed the Great Charter, Clause 39 of which states, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any other way except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. We get this rule of law from England, but the English law writers, of course, got it from ancient Roman jurisprudence. As our great founders attempted to set up a government free from tyranny, the rule of law and our constitutional separation of powers was key to restraining the passions of mobs and men. Being governed by laws, not men, is one of our most important legacies. We're now living at a time when President Biden, or whoever is handling President Biden, has fully weaponized his Department of Justice to do little other than persecute his political opponents, whether they be parents pushing back against school boards that are foisting the hatred and racism of critical race theory on their kids, voters attempting to restore basic security measures in their elections, or a former president who the regime simply can't abide. The same Department of Justice stands idly by as Christian churches, pro-life maternal care centers, and even Supreme Court justices are violently attacked and threatened. Previous to this administration, the Department of Justice and its Federal Bureau of Investigation was exposed as having been party to one of the most horrific attacks on our republic in history. It weaponized campaign dirty tricks brought, bought and paid for by Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton that accused her electoral opponent, Donald Trump, of being an active Russian agent. The investigation it spurred had no basis whatsoever, but through weaponized leaks and lies, this department tried to prevent President Trump from being elected, and then, once elected, continued the lies to undermine the will of the American people as expressed in their elections. It was interesting, I saw some members of the propaganda press here covering this, who actually helped perpetrate this hoax, this lie that Donald Trump had stolen the 2016 election by colluding with Russia. And I'm always wondering, I should probably take the opportunity to ask one of them, did they push this lie because they were so stupid that they believed it, or did they know it was a hoax and they pushed it anyway for political ends? What they did was very damaging to the country and they should feel very bad about it. So the FBI fabricated evidence to secure a warrant to spy on the Trump campaign, sent corrupt confidential human sources to surveil the campaign, and continued that spying well into the administration before launching a special counsel and other investigations to help cover up their crimes. It rang up scores of associates of Trump on process crime charges while allowing its own agents and operatives to skate for breaking the law while they were trying to unseat a legitimately elected president. And at the end of the day, no one was held accountable. In addition to the Russiagate hoax, they were co-conspirators in perpetrating, FBI also lied to big tech companies to get them to censor the Hunter Biden laptop story, which was really a story about the Biden family business and its potential corruption. The FBI raided Trump's lawyer's office and then leaked his privileged communications. They're lying and leaking like sieves to their propaganda associates at the Washington Post and New York Times about their political raid of his home. As one pundit put it, we've built an eight lane bridge over the Rubicon, folks. And the rule of law is getting harder to make out in the rear view mirror. It's worth looking in depth at just one particular example of our two standards of justice and what they do to a country. Following the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2020, extremist groups such as Black Lives Matter coordinated more than 10,000 demonstrations across more than 2,700 locations in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia. 
The scenes that came out of the riots around the country the first weekend of June 2020 were apocalyptic, although the media did their best to downplay the carnage. In one memorable image, MSNBC's Ali Velshi stood in front of a massive burning building in Minneapolis one night and said, I want to be clear how to characterize this. This is mostly a protest. It is not, generally speaking, unruly. CNN described what was happening in Kenosha as a fiery but mostly peaceful protest as fires and chaos raged in the background. At least 25 Americans were killed in these riots, which cost insurers more than $2 billion, all while the media relentlessly referred to them as peaceful or mostly peaceful. You might remember some of the language that was associated with this. ACAB, all cops are bastards, started appearing at BLM protests across the country. For instance, in Portland, when rioters toppled a statue of George Washington, they lit a fire on its head and tagged the statue with graffiti that said, genocidal colon colonist, BLM, ACAB, F cops, and 1619. When President Trump had worried earlier in his administration that statue removers wouldn't stop with Confederate figures, the media roundly mocked and derided him. My favorite thing that happened when he worried that they wouldn't stop at Confederate statues was they fact-checked his prediction that they wouldn't stop there. And they fact-checked that prediction about the future as false, and then just like a few months later, it turned out to be true. During the summer of violence, iconoclastic mobs moved from toppling Confederate statues to defacing, damaging, and destroying statues and memorials to Admiral David Farragut, abolitionist Matthias Baldwin, American Revolutionary War General Philip Schuyler, President and Commanding General of the Union Army Ulysses S. Grant, Francis Scott Key, Abraham Lincoln, the aforementioned George Washington, and Thomas Jefferson. And elites immediately, or so-called elites, immediately and vigorously supported the Marxist BLM movement. The 100 largest US companies pledged more than $1.63 billion to BLM and related organizations. Among the corporate donors to BLM, which has recently been in the news for massive mishandling of those funds, you almost have to respect them, were Uggs, Amazon, Gatorade, Microsoft, Warner Records, Nabisco, Spanx, Lululemon, I mean the list goes on and on. The exceedingly and vanishingly few companies that supported non-leftist movements, by contrast, were harassed and targeted. When Goya supported President Trump's Hispanic Prosperity Initiative, the company faced cancellation. When someone erroneously claimed that the CEO of Wendy's had donated to Trump, the, the chain faced an immediate social media backlash. Meanwhile, social media mobs and activists stirred up people portraying even de benign dec declarations of patriotism as racist. When NFL quarterback Drew Brees said he would never agree with anybody disrespecting the flag of the US or of the country, he was widely condemned for his support of patriotism and forced to ritualistically apologize. Breeze wrote on Instagram, I recognize that I should do less talking and more listening. That wasn't good enough. He had to apologize again. Then his wife had to apologize and her apology began very creepily, we are the problem. Celebrities and Democrat politicians also worked to bail out rioters who were being arrested for violent action in Minneapolis and other cities. As Minneapolis businesses and police precincts were being firebombed, businesses were being looted, and people were being attacked by rioters, then Senator Kamala Harris tweeted, if you're able to, chip in now to the Minnesota Freedom Fund to help post bail. Seth Rogen, Steve Carell, Patton Oswalt, a whole host of C-list celebrities announced their support of the fund to bail out rioters. They raised $35 million thanks to this support. Much of those funds, of course, went to bail out people who went on to commit, were, went out to bail out people who had committed violent crimes and who went on to commit more violent crimes. Downtown area around the White House was racked with violence as a result of these protests, which got out of control on May 31st. <coughs> Excuse me. As authorities were trying to enforce an 11 p.m. curfew, multiple fires broke out in Lafayette Park and firefighters had trouble getting through the protest to put out a blaze that had been set at St. John's Episcopal Church, one block from the White House. Aerial shots of the fires on cable news made it look like the White House was in the middle of a war zone. 
protesters clashed with law enforcement at the barriers set up around the White House, and at least 60 members of the Secret Service were injured in the chaos, including injuries sustained from the crowd throwing projectiles and Molotov cocktails. President Trump had to be moved to a secure location to protect him from the protesters. DC announced a 7 p.m. curfew on that Monday night. U.S. Park Police cleared the protesters in front of the White House so a stronger security fence could be put on the edge of Lafayette Park. Around the same time, President Trump addressed the nation from the Rose Garden, announcing that the country would restore rule of law and protection of civil liberties to jurisdictions where anarchy had prevailed. Afterward, he made that famous walk through Lafayette Park to St. John's Episcopal. The visit to the vandalized historic church where every president since James Madison has worshiped reassured many people in the country. For the left, however, these actions were nothing less than a criminal abuse of peaceful protesters. The media spun a tale of violent, jackbooted thugs running rampant through the streets over innocent, docile protest protesters. They first ran with tales that the park police had used tear gas to clear the area when they'd actually used the far less potent pepper balls. And that was because the crowd was throwing bricks, frozen water bottles, and caustic liquids at park police. The media were aghast that Trump would clear the park for a photo op, and the pressure, as they put it, the pressure to denounce Trump in response to their sensationalist reporting was intense. Defense Secretary Mark Esper, who attended the Rose Garden speech, withered in the face of criticism and claimed that he'd been misinformed about what was going on. Anti-Trump Republicans, such as Senator uh, ben Sass from Nebraska issued statements condemning the clearing of Lafayette Park. More than a year after the incident, the Inspector General of the Interior Department released a report confirming that the area had been cleared not for a photo op, but in order to build that security fence to protect the nation's executive residents from rioters. Further, it was actually Bowser's police force, sorry, Mariel Bowser, the DC mayor, her police force, not Trump's park police, who had used tear gas a few blocks away in response to separate violence from the crowd breaking curfew. But the damage was done. The hysterical media reaction would scare mayors and governors throughout the country away from restoring law and order. Portland has an even more acute insurrection problem. The city is the national hub of so-called Antifa, and violent activists spent months laying siege to the Mark O. Hatfield Federal Courthouse. Rioters had already burned Multnomah County Justice Center, jail, and the Portland Police Bureau HQ when they sat on the federal courthouse. One reporter wrote of this, I watch as injured officers were hauled inside. In one case, the commercial firework came over so fast, the officer didn't have time to respond. It burned through his sleeves, and he had bloody gashes on both forearms. Another had a concussion from being hit in the head with a mortar. The lights inside the courthouse have to be turned off for safety, and the light from high-powered lasers bounced across the lobby almost all night. The fear is palpable. Three officers were struck in the last few weeks and still haven't regained their vision. This siege went on for months. Yet Oregon Governor Kate Brown declared that additional federal troops that had to be brought in to protect the courthouse had acted as an occupying force. Very few people during this summer of violence were even charged with offenses in these cities in 2020. And of those who were, nearly every single one had their charges dropped within months. Like literally in some cities, 95% of the very few people who were even charged had their charges dropped. And so it's difficult to not think in comparison with how the Department of Justice and local prosecutors have handled, the, how, how they handled the insurrection of 2020 and the riot at the Capitol following a very fraught election. The Department of Justice that mostly stood by as federal courthouses, the White House, and national monuments and statues were attacked, put all its resources to bear on pretrial detention and imprisonment of anyone who was anywhere in the proximity of the Capitol riot, whether they were violent or not, whether they were grandmothers with cancer or not. In fact, some rioters have been given sentences by Democrat judges in excess of what already overzealous prosecutors had been asked for. And the US Congress that cared hardly at all, if at all, about what Americans were going through as their cities and businesses and homes were set ablaze, put aside you know, unimportant work such as defending the country's borders, having borders, 
holding people accountable for the mishandling of the COVID response, focusing on threats posed by China, working to secure a free economy in which Americans can flourish, working to tackle the fentanyl crisis that is killing so many Americans. All that unimportant work has been set aside so that anyone who has any questions about what was inarguably the weirdest election of our lifetime can have their lives destroyed. That committee and its co-conspirators are working to criminalize free speech activities, to seize private information, and to destroy, again, people's lives. And they're doing it with the full support and cheerleading of our corrupt propaganda press and other activists. A country does not survive two standards of justice, particularly two standards that are so far apart. It can't abide allowing corporate-funded insurrectionists who control the entire propaganda press to go to war against the American people destroying and attacking federal courthouses, the White House, monuments, while then handing down draconian punishments to even those on the far exteriors of the riot at the US Capitol. Rule of law has to mean one rule of law, not the variables we see weapon, weaponized right now by the administrative state. So what to do? There's work for everyone, whether it's tackling, again, our corrupt media that is such a threat to the republic through the many lies, misinformation, and disinformation they readily promulgate. It can be people running for office or supporting those who do, who are willing to use their authority to restrain the tyranny people are suffering under. It can be about teaching our own children, our values, the principles of our country, and also what is being done to fight those. And even those who stand and pray do also serve the Lord. There's also tar and feathers, much, much things that can be done, just kidding. But what everyone who does the work needs to do, what everyone who does do the work needs to keep in mind is the importance, as Anna said when she began, of courage and prudence. Virginia politician John Randolph of Roanoke said in the 1820s to say laws, not men, is rather like saying marriage, not women. The two cannot well be separated. We need good men in our laws, not men, understanding of how to approach things. The conservative establishment and its politicians and its media don't lack ideas or people. We don't lack good laws, but too many of its leaders do lack determination and endurance and fearlessness, and the people can tell. As it is said, men don't follow titles, they follow courage. Defense of the country and its rule of law is worth fighting courageously for. And as you fight, your courage will be contagious and will help others find a recovery of will as well. Thank you.